this evening's presentation by Mr. Gene Beach about Highlands Railroad and its history. Um, as we were discussing, we are having people muted. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the meeting. Um, at that time, you can type out your questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you so that we can keep this kind of orderly. Uh, Mr. Beach has a nice presentation ready for us. So I will give the floor to him, Mr. Beach. All right. Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Gene Beach, president of the Highland Township Historical Society. And this is the first of two presentations on the history of our railroad and its impact on Highland's development. Uh, before we get started, I would like to thank the co-sponsors of these talks the Highland Activity Center and the Highland Township Library. Uh, these are both great institutions. Uh, they're staffed by truly wonderful people and we are blessed to have them since they contribute so much to our uh, social and cultural life here in the township. I also wanna personally thank Mr. Justin Lado of the Activity Center who is serving as both tech support and moderator uh, for this Zoom meeting. And with that, let's get started. Uh, transportation has always played a big role in Highlands history. Uh, many of our early settlers, for example, made a point of locating along either the old White Lake Trail or the Shiawassee Trail. Uh, that not only made it easier for them to reach their homesteads in the first place, uh, but also to thereafter take their produce uh, to market and to bring back any needed supplies. More recently, uh, the construction of M59 in 1936 uh, had and continues to have a major impact. Uh, it stimulated the growth of what we now call East Highland, and perhaps more significant, it made it possible for folks to live here uh, but commute to jobs in other uh, communities, which in turn led to the surge in residential development. These talks, however, focus on the third form of transportation that played a huge role in Highlands development, and that is our railroad. And when I say our, I mean more than just the fact it happens to run through town. Uh, for as you'll hear, the folks in the Highland and Milford area uh, have a right to feel kind of possessive about it. Most of us today probably don't pay a whole lot of attention to the railroad. Uh, we may hear the occasional horn or uh, the rumble as a train rolls through. Uh, we may be delayed at one of our grade crossings. But generally speaking, the railroad is just part of the background. Uh, there are no depots, no freight yards, no sidings serving any industry or business. But from 1871, well up into the early 1950s, uh, our railroad was a truly big deal. It prompted the platting of two completely new villages and led to the demise of two older ones. It directly employed dozens of locals and stimulated the growth of industries and businesses that employed all oh. scores more. It opened up new markets for our produce and goods and it made it easier for goods and people from outside to come here. And while it was mostly a benefit to the township, uh, there were some negative impacts and we'll talk about all of those things in our second session next month. Tonight, however, is devoted to the truly fascinating story of how this railroad came to be built in the first place. And for that story to make sense, I need to share with you uh, a pretty extensive look at Michigan's early railroad history. Now, as it turns out, railroad mania took hold here uh, even before we became a state. Uh, after all, we had thousands of settlers pouring in from the east, all of whom needed some place uh, or some way to get to their homesteads uh, in the territory's interior, and then once settled, uh, a way to bring their produce and, and uh, whatnot to market. At first, many thought canals might be the solution, uh, which isn't surprising given how many of our settlers came here on the Erie Canal. But canals are expensive to build. Uh, they need locks and dams. And while they can move a lot of cargo, they are awfully slow. 
So by the early 1930s, it was clear that railroads would be the future of transportation. Most historians agree that Michigan's first successful railroad was the Erie and Kalamazoo. It received a charter from the Territorial Council in 1833 to build a line running from Toledo, which Michigan still claimed at that time, uh, 40 miles northwest to Adrian. Uh, construction was soon started and the line opened for business in late 1836. At first, the cars were pulled by horses, but within a year, the company introduced a steam locomotive called the Adrian, uh, which we can see in this old engraving, and thereby became the first steam-powered railroad in Michigan. Another early line was the Detroit and Pontiac Railroad Company, which was chartered in 1834. And as we can see on this old map from 1835, its route started in Detroit. If you follow the double dashed lines, uh, ran east of and roughly parallel to what would become Woodward Avenue. Construction got off to a very slow start, however, and it wasn't until 1838 that they had made it as far as Royal Oak. Uh, it then took another five years before they finally made it all the way to Pontiac in 1843. You should also understand that the state of Michigan itself uh, played a big role in our early railroad history. While there were dozens of railroad companies that were started, uh, at least on paper, only a handful of these were ever actually built. And they were all what today we would call a short line running from point A to point B, which did little to open up the state as a whole. So after being admitted to the Union in 1837, uh, Michigan decided to step in and build three long state-owned and operated rail lines. The so-called Southern Route was to start down here in Monroe and head west all the way to New Buffalo, uh, serving the counties here along the Ohio and Indiana border. The so-called Central Route was to start in Detroit, go through Ann Arbor, Jackson, Marshall, uh, all the way over to St. Joseph. And the Northern Line was supposed to start at St. Clair and head west across the Lower Peninsula all the way to Grand Haven. Unfortunately, this uh, scheme was hatched uh, just as the country fell into a major recession in 1837. So financing it proved difficult. And like most other government programs, it had more than its share of cost overruns and waste. So by the mid 1840s, the Southern Line had only made it as far as Hillsdale. The Central Line had only made it as far as Battle Creek, and the Northern Line was never started at all. So the state finally threw up its hands and sold both the Southern and Central Lines to private investors at a considerable loss. Uh, the key point for our purposes, however, is that all of these rail lines ran basically east-west. Uh, for the first 10 or 15 years, nobody proposed, much less actually built, a rail line running north of Pontiac. Uh, and why should they? I mean, most of the incoming settlers were located in the southern tier of counties, and there was yet nothing in the interior of the state that justified the cost and expense of building a rail line into an unexplored wilderness. By the mid-1840s, however, these lower counties had begun to fill up uh, such that new settlers were beginning to locate in counties like Genesee, Shiawassee, and Saginaw. Perhaps more importantly, it was in 1847 that mill owner Curtis Emerson uh, shipped the first cargo of Saginaw Valley pine to Albany, New York. The high quality of that timber uh, attracted a great deal of attention, and suddenly all of the eastern markets were clamoring for more Saginaw pine. By 1854, just seven years later, there were at least 14 mills in Saginaw that were turning out 60 million board feet of lumber a year. Uh, that's enough lumber to cover over two square miles with boards one inch thick. Now at first the railroads relied on the uh, water for transport. The logs were floated downstream to the mills and the sawn lumber was put on barges or ships and 
uh, floated to Detroit or Buffalo or Chicago. It didn't take a genius to realize, however, that as the easy pickings along the rivers and creeks were logged out, uh, the camps and the mills would need to move further and further inland to places like Clare and Farwell, uh, which could only be served by rail. You should also know that the railroad's interest in the lumber business uh, went beyond just the fares that it might earn carrying logs and and timber and workers and supplies. The railroads themselves needed the lumber that these mills were turning out for such things as railroad ties, uh, beams for bridges and trestles, and boards for depots and engine sheds. So there was a symbiotic relationship uh, between the timber and the railroad industries, so much so that a lot of lumber barons started investing in railroads and a lot of railroad tycoons started investing in timberlands and sawmills. Now, one of the earliest efforts at building a more northerly route uh, came in 1848, when the Oakland and Ottawa Railroad was chartered. That line started at Pontiac and headed west across northern Oakland County through Holly, Fenton, on into Shiawassee County, with the idea of eventually reaching Grand Haven. Um, Work began in 1852, and by 1855, as we can see on this map, uh, the tracks had been laid just west of Holly toward Fenton. Uh, it was also in 1855 that the Oakland and Ottawa merged with the old Detroit and Pontiac to form what was known as the Detroit and Milwaukee Railroad, uh, later called the Detroit and Milwaukee Railroad. And this is one of their old engines. Uh, as you can see, it's called the Pontiac. Uh, very simple, just four drive wheels, no pilot wheels, no trailing wheels under the cab. What really opened the Timberlands to rail traffic, however, was the construction of the Flint and Piermar Cap. Uh, it was incorporated in 1857 and was to run from Flint north to Saginaw, then west all the way across to what was then called Pier Marquette, uh, today the city of Ludington. Construction began in 1857, uh, starting in East Saginaw, and they headed initially south, uh, but it was hampered by another financial panic. Uh, by the end of 1858, only a third of the line between Saginaw and Flint had been cleared, and only three miles of that had actually been graded and made ready for laying the track. Thanks to the proceeds of a bond issued in 1859, however, the pace of the work increased and the line finally reached Flint in December of 1862. The only problem is that Flint was basically a dead end. Uh, it isn't a port and there was as yet no other railroad connecting it uh, to Detroit or anywhere else. In fact, the only operational railroad anywhere near Flint was the Detroit and Milwaukee. And you can see that on this map from uh, 1864. Here's the Pier Marquette coming down out of Saginaw to Flint. Here's the Detroit and Milwaukee through Holly, Fenton, Linden, et cetera. And there's a 20 some odd mile gap uh, in between them. Now the Pier Marquette had been aware of this problem uh, from the beginning, uh, going so far as to make a preliminary survey of a line down to Fenton. But with all the problems they were running into just completing the line between Saginaw and Flint, they never pursued the idea. Instead, the solution came uh, when this gentleman, Henry H. Crapo, stepped in to build his own line to link the Pier Marquette at Flint with the Detroit and Milwaukee tracks to the south. Crapo was born in Massachusetts in 1804, and he spent the first year, 50 years of his life there. Uh, becoming a very successful businessman whose ventures included the insurance business, uh, real estate, and whaling. Uh, starting around 1855, however, he began investing in Saginaw Valley lumber, soon owning some 12,000 acres of pine forest. And in order to see that investment personally, he moved to Flint in 1858, where he quickly grew to prominence. He was elected mayor of Flint in 1860, 
later went on to serve a term as state senator, and finally in 1864 was elected to the first of two terms as Michigan's governor. Uh, but for our purposes, it's Crapo's career as a railroad man that is most important. Given his big timber holdings, Crapo had an obvious personal interest in seeing that all of this Saginaw Valley lumber could be brought by rail all the way to Detroit without interruption. What's more, he had the financial resources uh, as well as the political connections necessary to ensure that the missing link between the Pier Marquette and the Detroit and Milwaukee could be quickly built. So on January 3 of 1863, Crapo incorporated what was originally called the Flint and Fentonville Railroad with the idea of bringing the line down uh, along the same survey that the Pier Marquette had previously considered. After further survey work, however, they decided that while slightly longer, a line from Flint to Holly would actually be easier to build. So they amended the Articles of Incorporation in October of 1863, renaming the company the Flint and Holly Railroad. Construction began almost immediately and the line opened a year later on November 1 of 1864. Not surprisingly, the Flint and Holly was an immediate success. Uh, in just its first month, it hauled over 460 tons of freight and made over $3,000 carrying passengers, uh, which is not bad when you consider that many of our early railroads struggled just to make ends meet. Uh, Crapo and his partners continued to run the Flint and Holly uh, as an independent company until April of 1868, when they sold it to the Flint and Pier Marquette, netting a tidy profit of $120,000 on their original investment, which today would be several million. So, uh, by the start of 1865, all of this Saginaw Valley lumber finally had a way to travel by rail without interruption, all the way down to Detroit. Uh, now you're probably wondering at this point, what in the world does all of this have to do with Highland and our railroad? When you're gonna start talking about that? And the answer is right now. And let's start by taking a closer look at this map, uh, showing Michigan's rail system as it existed in late 1864, early 1865. Here's that first line, the Erie and Kalamazoo. Here's the southern route that the state had originally begun and which by this time was the privately owned uh, Lakeshore Michigan Southern. Here's the central line the state started, which by this time was the privately owned Michigan Central. Here's the Detroit and Milwaukee. And here is the Pier Marquette with the Flint and Holly providing the missing link. Now imagine that instead of rail lines, these were walking trails, as many of our old rail lines now are. You're up here in Saginaw and start walking south. If you want to come to Detroit, you'd come through Flint down to Holly, then head uh, southeast toward Pontiac, no problem. But suppose instead you wanted to go to Wayne or Monroe or Toledo or any of these points out here to the west, maybe even Chicago. Chances are when you got to Holly, you might very well say, forget it, I'm gonna cut across country. Why make this wide swing to the east when you can save both time and distance by taking a more direct southerly route? Now hold that thought for a second while I give you another scenario. Suppose you're a businessman down here in Monroe, which in the early 1840s, everybody expected to grow into a major Great Lakes port thanks to the fact that it was going to be the eastern terminus of this Michigan Southern route. So you have invested in docks and warehouses and all sorts of other infrastructure. Not only that, you've given your wholehearted support to this railroad, both financial and political, to see that it's completed and up and running. And then suddenly the Michigan Southern pulls a fast one, first by leasing and later buying the old Erie and Kalamazoo and making Toledo its main port while your docks and warehouses sit empty and start to rot away. And to add insult to injury, all of this lumber that is pouring out of the Saginaw Valley is adding to Detroit's prosperity 
not Monroe's. Now hold that thought for a second while I give you the final piece of the puzzle. Suppose you were a resident of a little village known as Milford. You've got abundant water power that has allowed you to build several uh, profitable mills, and you've got stores and shops that are bringing in customers from all the surrounding community. And then suddenly a railroad gets built through a little upstart community to the north called Holly, which starts growing by leaps and bounds and takes away a lot of the business that you previously enjoyed. Now, if you put all those elements together, you've got a pretty volatile mix. Uh, it's really just a matter of time before somebody says, hey, we need to build our own railroad. The only question is where the spark is going to come from that sets the whole thing off. And believe it or not, the spark came from folks in the Milford and Highland area. In its very first issue, uh, February 18, 1871, the Milford Times published a letter from someone who signed their name simply now and then. And that letter starts off by complaining that a Northfield newspaper had recently published an item giving Northfield credit for the idea of coming up with our railroad. So to set the record straight, Mr. Now and Then says as follows. In the summer and fall of 1864, the citizens of Milford, feeling they were almost out of the world and feeling tired of thus occupying back seats, held a series of meetings to consider the best means of emerging from the backwoods and getting out into the sunlight of public observation. The result of these meetings was the appointment of a committee of three of the citizens of Milford to ascertain if they could find those disposed to aid in building a railroad as the most feasible project to aid in building up that material interest." Close quote. There is a similar uh, but much less flowery account that's found in Durant's History of Oakland County. And that says as follows. The most prosperous period in the history of Milford was during the years from 1850 to 1856. In the latter year, the Detroit and Milwaukee Railroad was constructed and in a large measure took off the trade of the village. The business portion of the community saw that the only way to obviate the decrease in trade was to open railway communication with Milford and thus partially at least secure to it the business that the Detroit and Milwaukee Railroad had taken from it. For the furtherance of this enterprise, several meetings were held, which were devoid of the desired result up to 1865, when the act of the legislature known as the Enabling Act was passed. Of course, it is hard to put a lot of faith in an anonymous letter to the editor. And while Durant's history is certainly a useful reference, it does have more than its fair share of mistakes, as I'll mention in just a bit. So as I was preparing these talks, I made a point of looking at some primary sources such as official state records, uh, corporate reports, and contemporary newspaper articles to see what else I could find. And as it turns out, the story told by Now and Then and Durant is, at least in its broad outlines, uh, fairly accurate. Starting in late 1863, uh, there was a lot of talk about building a railroad from Detroit to Howell. Uh, here, for example, is a item from the Free Press uh, that discusses later on all of the supposed advantages of that line. And initially, folks in our area uh, seemed supportive of that idea until it became clear that the proposed route would run too far south of Milford and Highland to do either one any good. So in March, uh, March 19, 1864, uh, there was a meeting held at Novi, composed of men from Milford, Highland, Novi, Lyon, and Plymouth, to the, explore the idea of a rail line uh, running north-south, starting at Holly. According to this free press article, uh, bad weather kept a lot of folks from attending, but among those who did was Henderson Crawford, who was the owner of a private academy that he taught at in Milford, 
and who was appointed secretary of the meeting, uh, as well as John L. Andrews, who was the owner of the Pettibone Mills. Now, there was a lot of discussion uh, about what it would take to we build such a line, uh, how much um, money might be raised, and just where it would run. Uh, Andrews, for example, noted that folks up in Highland had been talking about maybe running the line from Holly down to Ann Arbor, and he was concerned about that since it might uh, bass, uh, bypass Milford. So he was, quote, anxious to have the road run around their way, close quote. At the end of the day, however, uh, this meeting decided to appoint a committee to reach out, uh, either by letter or in person, to existing railroads, such as the Detroit and Milwaukee and the Flint and Holly, to see whether any of them would be interested in such a project. And among the members chosen for this committee were two from Milford, Crawford and Andrews, along with two from Highland, Squire Rowe and Henry DeGarmo. Now Rowe was arguably Highland's most prominent resident uh, at this time. He had settled in Highland in 1835 on what is now Lone Tree Road where he eventually built the big stone house that we know as Stone Row. He had served several terms as township supervisor and also justice of the peace. During the Civil War, he helped raise a company of infantry. And in late 1864, just a few months after this Novi meeting, uh, he was elected as Highland's representative uh, in the Michigan legislature. DeGarmo was another prominent Highland farmer and a noted cattle breeder. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a photo of him, but he is the one that built this large brick home on the west side of Milford Road, just north of the cemetery. So another prosperous, influential Highland resident. Now, I haven't found any further news accounts or other information uh, concerning this committee's activities. Based on what we know happened later, however, it's clear they were not able to persuade any of the existing railroads to build this new line. And under the circumstances, that's not surprising. Uh, Crapo, for example, was still trying, trying to finish his own Flint and Holly. And I suspect that the Detroit and Milwaukee did not have any interest in building a new line that might take business away from its Holly to Detroit segment. So if there was to be a railroad running through Highland, Milford, Novi, et cetera, uh, it quickly became apparent that the folks in those communities would have to take the initiative. Now let's jump ahead a couple of months to early 1864. As I mentioned, Squire Rowe had been elected to the Michigan legislature, I should say to 1865. And on February 21, 1865, just a few weeks into his term, he introduced a bill to authorize any of the towns or other municipalities incorporated or otherwise in the counties of Oakland, Livingston, Wayne, and Washtenaw to pledge their credit to aid in the construction of a railroad to commence at the village of Holly in the county of Oakland and thence extending southward to some point on the Michigan Central Railroad. Now I should mention at this point that Durant's history uh, includes a biography of Henderson Crawford which claims that he, Crawford, uh, was the one who actually sponsored this bill. Sadly, uh, this is one of those instances where DeMorant is demonstrably wrong. Uh, the fact is Crawford never served in the legislature at any time, either as a senator or a representative. And as we can see, the official journal of the Michigan House representatives clearly identifies Roe as the sponsor. I'm not sure exactly how or why Durant made that mistake, uh, but unfortunately it has since been repeated uh, in Milford's 1982 history book and will likely continue to mislead uh, the unwary, all of which is why uh, secondary sources like Durant should always be checked against the primary records. Crawford did, as we'll see, play an important role in railroad's history, but it was not as a member of the legislature. 
Now, like most bills, uh, Roe's proposal went to committee where it was reviewed and was subjected to some suggested amendments. It thereafter was returned to the full house where it passed on March 10 of 1865. But since the Michigan constitution requires that the title of every bill accurately reflect its contents, Roe had to make a last minute motion to amend the title of his bill by including Monroe County up here and by changing the last line from someplace on the Michigan Central to the city of Monroe in the county of Monroe. Now, why that change? Well, there were likely several reasons. First of all, bringing this new line down from Holly all the way to Monroe would basically connect it with all of Michigan's other major rail lines. At Holly, it would connect to the Detroit and Milwaukee as well as the Pier Marquette, Flint and Holly. Uh, at Wayne, it would connect to the Michigan Central. And Monroe, it would connect to the Michigan Southern. Um, what's more, extending that line all the way down would permit all of this Saginaw Valley timber to travel all the way to Monroe, Toledo, and out toward Chicago uh, without having to go through Detroit. And finally, for all of its troubles, uh, Monroe was still a sizable city that had a lot of businessmen who could likely help uh, finance this project. So making Monroe the southern terminus of this new line made sense for a variety of reasons. The key point for our purposes, however, is that the push to build such a line uh, originated and was coming from folks in this area. It was people from Highland, Milford, and nearby townships that started the ball rolling and it was Highland's representative, Squire Rowe, who took the first tangible step uh, by introducing this legislation. Now, it's important to understand that Rowe's bill was not a corporate charter. It didn't create a railroad company. Instead, what his act did was allow townships or villages along the proposed route to use public funds uh, to help build it, either in the form of loans or outright donations. Uh, simply put, this was an early version of the kind of public-private partnerships that we see today where, for example, a big corporation agrees to put a, a plant or warehouse in your town in exchange for tax abatements. Perhaps more important than the, the actual money, however, was the uh, act's public relations value since it gave the advocates of this new railroad uh, something tangible to point to when trying to sell the idea to potential investors. I mean, if the state legislature felt it was worthwhile enough to allow public money to be spent, uh, it must be a sure thing, right? So with Rose bill in hand and signed into law, the pr promoters lost no time in moving forward. On May 20th of 1865, uh, they held another small meeting in Novi, at which John Swift of Northville served as chairman and Henderson Crawford of Milford served as secretary. And at this meeting, they passed two resolutions. First, to schedule a larger general meeting at Northville for June 16th. And second, to start generating public interest by having Crawford prepare and send out a press release. Now, it seems that news of this initial meeting uh, actually started circulating before Crawford uh, put out his statement. Here, for example, is a Detroit news item on June 8th, uh, noting that the friends of this road and the people along its line are now actively canvassing for its immediate construction. Three days later, on June 11th, the Free Press published uh, the formal press release which as we can see was dated at Milford on June 9th. And with that, the campaign to build our railroad uh, was truly underway. Now this second general meeting at Northville on June 16th is where things 
really started to happen uh, as before a press release was put together. So we have a great idea of what happened. And first and foremost was the adoption of a more formal structure with the election of a president, three vice presidents and a secretary. And in that regard, it's interesting that the gentleman elected president was none other than Henry de Garmo of Highland. So again, someone from this area uh, is in the forefront of the campaign to build our railroad. Another interesting thing this committee or second meeting did was to establish committees uh, for each community along the proposed route who were asked to quote, ascertain and report what can be done in their several townships with reference to obtaining right of way and how much stock will probably be taken in each township in order to be certain as far as possible how the property owners along the proposed route feel toward this enterprise, close quote. And as we can see from another part of this uh, press release, um, the members of this committee for Highland were Henry DeGarmo, Squire Rowe, and Benjamin F. Davison of West Highland. Now this portrait of Davison, by the way, comes from Durant's history of Oakland County. And since you had to pay extra to get your portrait included, that tells you that he was another heavy hitter here in the township. Uh, he was a successful farmer who, like Rowe, had been very active in local politics. He had been elected several times as both um, Highland supervisor and treasurer. So you've got three of Highland's most prominent men of this period, Rowe, DeGarmo, and Davison, who are going to be talking with their friends and neighbors in an effort to drum up support for this project. As for Milford, uh, its committee members were Henderson Crawford, Daniel Morrison, and J.J. Morrison. Now, the Morrisons, who were father and son, had come to Milford from Ireland. Uh, Daniel was a druggist and boot seller in the village, and the family had been instrumental in the establishment of St. Mary's Church. So again, well-known, uh, respected people who could easily explain the advantages of this new railroad to their friends and neighbors. The last thing that this Northville meeting did was to schedule yet a, another meeting for July 14th, uh, this time at Monroe, which was the largest community along the proposed route and the one from which, as I said, most of the investment would likely need to come. Now, in that regard, you've got to admire the strategy. Uh, this all started with informal discussions here in the Milford Highland area. They then hold that preliminary meeting in North in Novi, uh, which apparently never went anywhere. Squire Rowe then introduces his bill, which is passed. They then hold a second small meeting at Novi, then a larger meeting at Northville with DeGarmo chosen as president and wind up with this large meeting down in Monroe. Uh, so they're mo slowly moving south uh, along the proposed route, holding bigger and bigger meetings as they go, uh, getting more and more organized at each step and generating more and more press coverage and public excitement. Uh, as PR campaigns go, this one was pretty clever. So it's no surprise that the July meeting down in Monroe uh, was a big hit. Once again, a press release was prepared, which the Free Press kindly published in full. Uh, and the first thing to notice is they did not call this a meeting, but a convention, which is a much more grandiose, important sounding word. Uh, DeGarmo again served as president, and he and others gave several speeches um, after which uh, several resolutions were passed. Of these, the two most important were, number one, to print and distribute a circular explaining the advantages of this new railroad, and number two, to appoint a committee uh, composed of members from each of the three counties involved, 
who were instructed, quote, to confer with capitalists and railroad companies to see on what terms they will agree to iron the track and run and continue the road. So again, they hadn't totally given up on this idea that some other railroad company might want to step in uh, and take over the project once the promoters had secured the necessary right of way. Now, as I said earlier, the folks down in Monroe uh, were truly angry over what they saw as a betrayal by the Michigan Southern. So they were more than happy to lend their support to this new line. Uh, right after this convention, the Monroe Monitor published a very glowing editorial urging all Monroe businessmen to give their full support to the project. Uh, a week later, the Toledo Blade reprinted that editorial and added that the new line would also benefit Toledo by giving it a shorter, more direct route to Northern Michigan without having to go through Detroit. So once again, the PR campaign was working brilliantly, generating lots of favorable press, all of which is kind of amazing when you recall that all of this started as an effort by folks in our area who just wanted to regain business they had lost to Holly. The reason it worked, however, is that they were also able to present this new railroad as something that would benefit uh, all of these other larger, more influential towns such as Monroe, Plymouth, and Northville. Of course, the downside of pitching the wider audience uh, was that as it moved forward, the people from Milford and Highland started getting edged out by the bigwigs from these larger towns. But I suspect that our folks didn't care all that much about that as long as the railroad was actually built. And that goal took the next big step forward when the Holly Wayne and Monroe Railway Company was officially incorporated on November 17 of 1865. Uh, there's a bit of confusion, however, about exactly how to render its name. Uh, the cover page of its first annual report, which covered the year 1866, spells everything out, Holly, Wayne, and Monroe Railway Company. In its reports for 1869 and 70, however, they take out the word and and substitute an ampersand. And then in their report for 1871, they replace the and, but abbreviate the word company and stick an Oxford comma after the word Wayne. So I guess you can have your pick as to which of those uh, different variations you prefer. Be that as it may, the company was finally organized and apparently off to a good start. Um, just a month after it was incorporated, the Free Press reported that a preliminary survey had been done for a 63-mile route from Holly to Monroe, and that, quote, efforts are being made to immediately get stock subscribed, close quote. But you know how it is. Uh, enthusiasm has a way of evaporating when the time comes to put your money where your mouth is. So raising the funds needed to actually build this line uh, proved far more difficult than the promoters originally uh, anticipated. Part of the problem, I suspect, is what might be called railroad fatigue. There were literally dozens of railroads being proposed during this period. Uh, so in, potential investors were either already tapped out or at a loss to decide which one might prove the better investment. And even when the folks did subscribe to buy stock, uh, they were often very, very slow to pay for it, if at all. So over the next several years, you'll find notices like this one in the free press uh, and other papers asking the stockholders to pay up. Uh, the company had been capitalized for a million dollars, but according to its 1868 annual report, uh, only 275,000 in stock had actually been subscribed to and of that, only 97,000 had actually been paid in. Neither did the public funding, which Squire Rose Bill authorized, ever really amount to much. Uh, as of 1868, only $135,000 in such municipal aid had been approved, 
And under the terms of the act, that wasn't available until at least part of the line was up and running. So it's no surprise that construction got off to a very slow start. And given that most of the available funds had been contributed by the Monroe investors, they insisted that the work start there. Uh, after all, if the line could be built at least as far north as Wayne, they could connect with the Michigan Central and start generating at least some revenue from traffic running between that line and the Michigan Southern. In any case, it wasn't until well, late 1866 uh, that the company finally started entering into contracts to grade the first 20 miles of the line north of Monroe. As you might expect, that resulted in a whole new round of positive press coverage. Uh, here's an item that was originally published in the Monroe Monitor in which the free press reprinted. Uh, and as you can see, it talks about the start of the work and goes on to say that the new road will do an immense business as soon as it is in running order. But funding continued to be a problem. Uh, on May 20 of 1867, the Monroe Board of Trade, basically their Chamber of Commerce, uh, held a special meeting at City Hall to hear a report on the efforts by the mayor and others to sell more stock. Uh, it was reported that 14400 had been raised, but there was another $5,600 they were still trying to find buyers for. In August uh, of that year, the Monroe Commercial, another newspaper, uh, noted that there were 175 men at work on the line and that the job was going, quote, quite satisfactory. But in the very next sentence, uh, the paper said, quote, let the stockholders make their payments promptly and the work will go forward with unabated zeal, close quote. As time went on, however, the company's difficulties only increased. Uh, on May 20 of 1868, they held a corporate meeting, annual meeting, at the Union Hotel in Wayne. And since a detailed account of that meeting was published in the free press, uh, we have a good idea of the problems idea. Yeah. that the railroad was facing. One of these involved the survey uh, of the line between Monroe and Wayne. Uh, in an effort to make that stretch as straight as possible and avoid having to straddle, uh, cut through the middle of somebody's farm, the original survey called for the tracks to straddle the north-south section lines. Um, and at first blush, that sounds like a good idea. But as any competent surveyor knows, uh, north-south section lines don't always line up as you pass from one township to another. They are often shifted uh, slightly east or west to compensate for the fact that north-south section lines converge as you get closer and closer to the North Pole. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the way that Milford Road has a jog in it uh, as you cross over from Highland into Rose. That's because the north-south section lines in Rose are offset over 100 feet from the corresponding section lines in Highland. There's also a similar jog on South Hickory Ridge as you go from Highland into Milford. For whatever reason, however, the railroad surveyors apparently forgot about that, quote, thus throwing the alignment of the road entirely without our right of way, and then it very generally making unequal quantities on either side of the section lines, thus causing much delay and expense and new negotiations to secure the requisite line and right of way, close quote. In other words, a very uh, costly uh, mistake. It was also reported that some 18 and a half miles of roadbed had been completed, including culverts and cattle guards. But to finish the line just as far as Northfield would require moving an additional 164,000 cubic yards of dirt. Uh, no easy job in the days before bulldozers and dump trucks. Of course, the company tried to put the best face it could on things, uh, but again, felt it necessary to urge stockholders, quote, 
fulfill their honest obligations, close quote, by paying in whatever remained on their promised contributions. Finally, this meeting ended uh, with an election of corporate officers and directors. One of these was David Noble of Monroe, uh, who was chosen as both a director and as the president. Uh, he was a local politician in Monroe who had served as mayor, uh, state representative, and a congressman, and had actually worked previously for the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago Railroad, so he actually had some railroad experience. Of more interest to us, however, though, is that Henry DeGarmo of Highland and John Andrews of Milford uh, were also chosen as directors. So while no longer running the show, uh, men from Highland and Milford were still playing an active role in the railroad's affairs. By the end of 1868, however, many began to wonder uh, if this railroad would ever be completed. On November 17th, the Free Press published a lengthy article about a meeting of railroad executives in Detroit. And among those who attended was James Joy, uh, who was general counsel for the Michigan Central and would later go on to be its president. Joy Road, by the way, is named for him. And in his speech, uh, Joy talked about a number of different railroads, including the Holly Wayne and Monroe. And as you can see, he said, quote, he thought that the Holly and Monroe will hardly ever be built, for he knew of no place they could get the money to iron and stock the road if built. Besides, they had been to the Michigan Central Railroad to have that company aid them in building it, close quote. Now, needless to say, uh, talk like that started making folks nervous, uh, especially down in Monroe, where they, they appointed a special committee to, quote, investigate and report as to the condition, affairs, prospects, et cetera, of the road. That committee delivered its findings at a meeting that was held on April 15th of 1869, and among other things, reported that it would take another $40,000 or so just to finish the roadbed from Monroe to Holly. In other words, just to finish clearing trees, uh, grading, laying gravel, et cetera. Uh, after which there was still track that they had to buy and lay, uh, locomotives and cars they'd need to purchase, depots they'd need to build, et cetera. Simply put, the Holly Wayne and Monroe was in deep financial trouble. Now, as it turns out, there was another big railroad meeting up in Saginaw in late 1869. Uh, it was a two-day affair that was held to encourage uh, support for the idea of making St. Ignace the eastern terminus of the Northern Pacific Railroad, one of the three uh, great transcontinental railroads that was then being talked about. So not surprisingly, it drew railroad executives lumber barons, politicians, civic leaders, and others from all over the state, uh, including officers and directors of both the Holly Wayne and Monroe and the Flint and Pier Marquette. Now, I have not found, and I wouldn't expect to find any record of whether uh, representatives of those two companies met privately uh, to discuss the idea of having the Pier Marquette come to the Holly Wayne's rescue. But it wouldn't surprise me that they did meet, and there's at least some evidence that the fate of the Holly Wayne came up uh, during this big meeting in Saginaw. And the reason I say that is this, uh, within days after the folks from Monroe got back home, uh, there was yet another meeting in that city to hear a report on what had been discussed up in Saginaw. And in the course of that meeting, Quote, it was reported by one or two gentlemen that rumors had been circulated north, meaning up in Saginaw, that the Monroe, Wayne, and Holly Railroad had been passed out of the hands of the directors and been sold to the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern Railroad Company. This was most positively contradicted and any inclination or disposition to do so denied. The whole object of the proposed road is to secure a competing line north and south, close quote. But of course, you know, where there's smoke, there's often fire. 
And it's entirely possible that the folks who were circulating those rumors simply got the name and the perspective buyer wrong. Uh, we'll probably never know one way or another, but it is kind of fun to speculate. Suffice it to say, uh, the next year, 1870, saw all work on the Hollywood and Monroe grind to a halt. Contractors weren't being paid. There were threats of litigation and it looked like the line was doomed. Uh, on February 26th of 1870, the Free Press published this item from its Holly correspondent who says, quote, the Holly Wayne and Monroe Railroad has been said to be secured to this point for the past five years. And all that time has only succeeded in grading a little over 26 miles from Monroe this way, as far as Plymouth or near Northville. The result has been to discourage nearly all of our citizens who ever had any confidence in it. And there is hardly to be found a person who now believes it will ever be built, close quote. But just as it seems that, or seemed like the project was doomed, uh, things were also happening up north with the Flint and Pier Marquette. By this time, it had taken over Crapo's Flint and Holly and in the process secured the services of George C. Kimball, who had been Crapo's right-hand man, and who was now general superintendent uh, for the combined company. Kimball is described as an energetic manager. In addition to the Pier Marquette, he also had interests in both the iron and timber industries. So he was by all accounts, a very shrewd and aggressive businessman. Now, as we saw, the only access that the Flint and Pier Marquette had to Detroit was over this stretch of the Detroit and Milwaukee tracks. And while that relationship had worked well enough for the past several years, um, it was easy to foresee that as the Detroit and Milwaukee developed its traffic out on this segment of the line, the Pier Marquette's trains might either be crowded out or forced to pay more for the privilege of using this bit of track. So Kimball is said to have been casting about for another outlet and entered into negotiations to take over and run the Holly Wayne and Monroe. They reached a final deal in November of 1870 that was basically a long-term lease. Uh, indeed, the Pier Marquette kept the Hollywood alive as a separate corporation for several years, uh, at least on paper, probably as a way to insulate itself from the Hollywood's creditors. Now, make no mistake, uh, the Flint and Pier Marquette was not a white knight that raced to the rescue of the failing Hollywood. Uh, it was more like a vulture that waited for the Hollywood to die before swooping in for a free meal. Uh, Kimball was a hard-nosed businessman who was looking to make a profit, not play hero. Although that didn't stop folks from viewing him as such up and down the line. In Monroe, for example, they held what the free press called, quote, the largest and most enthusiastic demonstration that old Monroe has made for years, close quote. Uh, there were fireworks, bonfires, a concert by the Monroe Band. The governor showed up and made a speech where he actually waved around a copy of the signed agreement, and everybody then had free suppers courtesy of several of the local hotels. Uh, as it turns out, however, Monroe's celebration was somewhat premature uh, because the Flint and Pier Marquette took a totally different approach to the work. As I mentioned earlier, the Monroe interests had originally focused on completing this stretch of the line, uh, since that might generate some profit running between the Michigan Central and the Michigan Southern. In contrast, the Pier Marquette focused on the northern segment of the line, because that is what would give them the alternative access to Detroit. So as a result, the Link down to Monroe was actually the last segment that was finished. Instead, they started at Wayne, 
and started working their way north, opening the line as they went. Uh, the Milford Times for February 21, 1871, reported that contracts had been entered into for 6,000 tons of rail, with the first 800 tons to be delivered in April. Quote, the intention of the company is to lay their tracks from Wayne to Northville as rapidly as possible, ballast and put it in running order, close quote. This will, it is believed, be accomplished by the 1st of May. And that article goes on to say that other contracts had been entered into for spikes, bolts, nuts, and four locomotives, while the Pier Marquette itself was starting to build freight cars at a factory that they had recently opened up here in Saginaw. Less than a month later, on March 11, 1871, uh, the Milford Times published this advertisement wanted 500 men and 100 teams to work on the line of the Holly Wayne and Monroe Railroad immediately north of Milford, a um, segment that included much of Southern Highland. Now think about that for a second. Uh, that's more men working on just this one subcontract than the old company had ever employed on the whole line. What's more, the 1870 census uh, shows that the combined population of Milford and Highland was only about 3,000 people, including women and children. So while I'm sure there were some local men that responded to that ad, there was no way you were going to get 500 of them uh, just from this area. You were going to have to bring them in from elsewhere, uh, including a fair number of Irish immigrants. Of course, if you were a Milford businessman, that ad probably had you rubbing your hands together in gleeful anticipation. 500 men at $1.50 a day times six days, that's around $4,500 a week in payroll, uh, a good portion of which is gonna be spent in your town on clothes, shoes, tobacco, medicine, you name it. And 100 teams earning $3 a day, um, many of them are going to need to have their horses reshod or their harnesses mended or their wagons repaired. So thousands of dollars is going to be pouring into the local Milford economy, which sounds pretty good, right? Uh, at least until you realize that a fair amount of that money is also going to be spent on booze. And sure enough, just one week after this ad appeared, the Times published this item on March 18th, quote, our village yesterday was the scene of several most disgraceful, disgraceful fights among the laborers on the railroad. It being the anniversary of St. Patrick's Day, our village was filled with them and under the maddening influence of whiskey dispensed from the filthy holes which infest our village and fights innumerable were the order of the day in attempting to quell the disorders and arrest the rioters, Constable Giddings was roughly handled by the drunken crew, close quote. And this wasn't the only uh, problem that the railroad's construction uh, brought about. In addition to fights and drunkenness, there were a lot of complaints about how long it was taking to decide uh, where the Milford Depot was going to go. Uh, in its issue for May 20th, 1871, the Times noted that since the line would presumably be open in the fall, uh, everyone needed to know the location of the depot in order to be able to build an adjoining warehouse to store the grain that the farmers would be shipping out. Uh, nothing happened and in July, uh, the Times again complained about the delay, noting that if the site of the depot wasn't picked soon, um, a lot of that year's harvest would probably go to Detroit by wagon rather than by train. The bridge over Main Street was also a bone of contention uh, to the point that the village fathers had to get involved. Up here in Highland, uh, they had a lot of trouble making a stable roadbed over some of our wetlands. On May 13, 1871, the Times reported that some six rods of tracks so 99 feet had sunk about seven feet uh, after the ground below slid into a nearby pond. Basically what happened was the weight of all the new dirt and gravel uh, pressed down on the wet muck underneath and caused it to squirt out into the pond. 
Ironically, that particular pond was just across Norfolk Road from the DeGarmo home. And even as all this was going on in Milford and Highland, however, the road was uh, slowly making its way north from Wayne. Uh, on August, April 27, 1871, the first excursion train uh, from Wayne arrived at Plymouth. On May 17, uh, the first train arrived at Northville, which celebrated with uh, fireworks and by decorating the town with flags and banners. And on September 2, 1871, uh, the Times noted that track had been laid just west of Novi Corners and that the line is expected to reach Milford in two or three weeks. Now the arrival of Milford's first train was undoubtedly front page news in the Milford Times, but unfortunately the issue in which that story would have appeared uh, apparently has gone missing before the paper's archives could be microfilmed and scanned. So if any of you are rummaging through the attic and find a copy of the Milford Times for September 30, 1871, please let us know. I'm sure I'm not the only one that would love to see it. Uh, thankfully, the Pontiac Weekly Gazette also covered the event in its September 29th issue and that indicates that the first train arrived at Milford on Tuesday, September 25, 1871. That article, by the way, uses some of the most flowery, over-the-top language that I have ever read, even by 19th century standards. Consider the opening sentence. Tuesday last, the 25th of September, 1871, will ever be remembered by the inhabitants of the village and country surrounding Milford as a great day, the natal day of prosperity, the wedding day of the place to the outer world by the bond of iron and steam, and right royally was it celebrated. That article goes on to describe how folks started arriving at daybreak, uh, such that by noon there was a huge crowd watching the work crews coming up from the south. Finally, at 1 p.m., quote, the booming cannon and the scream of the engine whistle announced that Milford had a railroad and a construction train having on board Superintendent Kimball and the workmen and many visitors from the lower end of the line halted at the south end of the trestle work over the Huron River. At that point, everybody then headed to a picnic ground southwest of the village, maybe Southside Park, I'm not sure where, quote, the housewives and bells of Western Oakland County had been busy arranging an entertainment for the crowd, close quote. They had set up tables in a huge square, uh, 200 feet on a side, which could reportedly seat 1,500 people at a time, in which the paper says, quote, absolutely groaned under the profusion of bounties calculated to satisfy the epicure or appetite of a hungry man, close quote. Of course, while everybody was eating their fill, there was the usual round of toasts. Henderson Crawford gave no less than nine separate toasts uh, covering just about everybody and everything connected to the railroad and concluding with this gem. The ladies, God bless them. Their beauty crowns our feast their graces rule our hearts, while their cooking has made us too full for utterance. Their works do follow them. So as you can tell, it was quite the celebration there in Milford. Uh, speaking of which, this coming September 25 of 2021 uh, is going to mark the 150th anniversary of that first train in Milford. I'm not sure if any event has been planned and with COVID and I'm not sure how we would pull it off, but it is something to, to think about. Now it's unclear uh, just when the first train arrived here in Highland, although at the pace they were laying track, I suspect it was in either late September or early October. Uh, and since the Highland section of the line passed through what was then uh, open country, I doubt there was any organized uh, welcome party. 
anyone that was interested in flowery speeches or tables groaning with food had probably already had their fill of it down in Milford. There is, however, a very charming story that is often told uh, about that first train through our township. Jonathan Clark Leonard, uh, who was a son of Highland pioneer Harvey Leonard, owned a farm on North Milford Road. And at the time, this farm included 60 acres on the east side through which the railroad was supposed to run. And the story goes that Mr. Leonard not only bought a couple shares of Holly Wayne stock, but he also donated the right of way through his property with the stipulation that one northbound and one southbound train stop each day at Highland. So now with the line finally completed through the township, Mr. Leonard and his family gathered at this little lane here, just opposite West Wardlow, uh, which is what gave them access across the tracks to the rest of their property. And as the train approached from the south, it slowed to a stop while the engineer and crew uh, exchanged greetings with the family, among whom was a very young Cora Leonard. She was three or four years old. And after chatting for a bit, the engineer is said to have looked down at Cora and asked, how would you like a train ride? She said, yes. So she was helped up into the cab and then the engine slowly steamed north while the family walked along on foot until they reached East Wardlow where the train again stopped and Cora was returned to her parents. So as a result, uh, Cora Leonard was always known as the first Highland resident to ever ride the new railroad. She didn't ride it very far, but she was the first. Cora, by the way, went on to marry Charles Wesley Gordon and lived to a truly ripe old age. Uh, this photo was taken during her 100th anniversary, or 100th birthday, excuse me, in 18, uh, 1968. And she would go on to reach 103 before her death in 1971. Uh, this is how I remember her uh, back when I was a teenager, and I suspect some of you may remember her as well. So, uh, by the end of October, 1871, the railroad was complete through both Milford and Highland and either had or would soon be connected with another part of the line that was being built south from Holly through Rose. Uh, that stretch also gave them a lot of problems because of all the wetlands they needed to cross. Uh, and you'll see items in various papers about having to bring in and drive 60 and 70 foot long pilings uh, down through the muck in order to reach firmer ground. Uh, but they did it. And by December 31, 1871, the entire line was finally finished all the way from Holly south to Monroe. By the way, let me just briefly describe the kinds of things you might've seen rolling down the track when this line opened. Uh, most, if not all, of the Pierre Marquette's early locomotives are what were known as American-class engines uh, because that style was so popular in this country from about 1850 all the way up to 1900. They are technically known as a 440, meaning that they have four pilot wheels up front, four drive wheels, and no trailing wheels. The one seen here uh, by the way, is Flinton Pier Marquette engine number one, uh, which was its first ever locomotive. They bought it used from a railroad in western New York and shipped it by barge to Saginaw. Uh, it was originally called the Pahiwag, but after the Pier Marquette rebuilt it, they renamed it the Pioneer. Note in that regard that all of these early engines had names as well as numbers. Uh, engine number 10, for example, was the Holly. Engine number 12, which we see here, was the H.H. Crapo. I went so far as to even put his portrait up on the headlight box. Engine 24, which unfortunately I don't have a picture of, was the Milford. Um, like the Pioneer, many of these other early engines were also bought used uh, from Eastern railroads that had outgrown them. 
As for rolling stock, the Pierre Marquette, as I said, built its own freight cars at a factory they had opened up in Saginaw. By 1872, it employed 540 men who that year turned out 59 boxcars, 43 lumber lorries, eight general purpose flat cars, and a handful of other specialized rolling stock. It appears, however, um, that most of the palace cars, the ones that were used for passenger service, were either purchased from uh, outside coach builders, such as Michigan Car Company or the Detroit Car Company. So uh, that is the story of how the railroad through Highland came to be. Uh, of course, they say success has many fathers. So if you read the histories of some of the other towns and cities along the line, they will often try to take credit for it. Uh, that's especially true of a 1890 history of Monroe County, which suggests that it was the big convention in Monroe that uh, was where the whole thing started. And as you'll recall, uh, now and then had written his letter uh, to refute claims by Northville paper that gave Northville all the credit. As I hope I've shown you, however, there's a fair amount of reliable evidence that men from the Milford and Highland area uh, were in the forefront of getting this railroad started. Squire Rowe is the one who introduced the public assistance bill and the various news accounts and press releases show that Rowe, Crawford, DeGarmo, Davison, Andrews and other local men uh, were among the railroad's earliest promoters. So as a result, um, both Highland and Milford are, I think, justified in proclaiming this to be our railroad. Now in our next session next month, uh, we're gonna be talking about all the different ways that the coming of the railroad impacted the community. So we'll be looking at such things as the platting of Highland Station and Clyde, uh, the decline of Spring Mills and West Highland, the impacts on uh, commerce, communication, industry, agricultural, et cetera, as well as uh, some of the negative impacts that the railroad had. So I hope you'll be able to uh, join us uh, for part two of this series uh, next month. And thank you. Justin, can we open it up for any questions? Um, sure. Does anyone currently have any questions for Mr. Beach? You can either raise your hand or I'll make a comment in chat. Do you have any questions, Hank? No, I think it's that. Good. I had, a, I had a question about the uh, uh, horse-drawn cars that you started out with. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, I can, yes. Yeah. Did you hear my question? I did. Okay. Um, that was not uncommon to start with. I mean, locomotives were expensive, right? And you needed trained engineers to fire the boilers and make sure you didn't blow the whole thing up. So once you laid track, and that was a pretty straightforward job, okay. um, and you had the grades, which were fairly gentle, never more than two or three percent grade, uh, a horse could pull a single car and a uh, nice straight line. I mean, horses had been pulling canal boats right, uh, right. for decades. So that's the way they would get things rolling and start to generate some income uh, until they could afford that engine. Okay, so that was very, uh, very I, common part of the evolution. No, I can't. After they had the track down, got some rolling stock purchased, that was one way to start generating the revenue then. It was, it was. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, I got a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Gene, uh, it's interesting when you covered all of this, this country was in the midst of a civil war. What uh, was the impact of that on all of this? Well, the civil war actually stimulated the development of railroads in the north. Okay. Okay. Um, it was devastating to railroads in the south, but it stimulated 
railroads in the north precisely because you were needing to move men and supplies and get from point A to point B in a hurry. And in fact, much of the Union strategy in the latter part of the war was to make use of the railroads as rapid transportation. Uh, before the days of, of trucks and airplanes, that's how you quickly moved an army from one place to another and hopefully got the jump on the opposition. Um, and with the federal government buying uh, lumber, buying produce to feed them, buying wool to clothe them, uh, people were making money hand over fist. I mean, sad as it is, war profiteering was quite common uh, during the Civil War. So people had money to invest. Um, and that, that was just the, the sort of the economic reality. Okay. You're welcome. Anyone else? Was Ludington named Pierre Marquette at the time the railroad? Yes, was uh, it was. And it became known as Ludington because it was Mr. Ludington who started uh, developing the timber out on that side of the state. So it's named for a timber baron. <laughs> Same way Standish, Standish is named for a timber baron. Renamed for a timber baron. Well, okay. <laughs> I have one comment um, about the Civil War. You've got to understand that many of the young men who were in the Civil War from this area, Highland, Milford, they had never been out of the state. A lot of them hadn't even been to Detroit, probably. But when they got out and they saw these things and they saw what the transportation did in moving goods and men, whatever, they came back home and they were all for this. They wanted to see this come to their towns. Made a huge difference. Also, Eugene, I have a picture for you. I'll get it to you this week. Okay. Of, of the first train going through Melford over the arch with the old wooden trell. Um, I want to say trellis. That's not what I want to say. Trestle. Trestle, yes. Oh, really? So <laughs> the old it, wooden it, trestle I have for you. It's not oh. for sale and not for sharing, but I'll let you put it with your work if you'd like. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a great picture. So, um, I'll take, go ahead. 1875-76. Okay. okay. So that would be after the first. After the first train, it's very similar to the one, and I could check the number on it. You said it would be 24? Well, uh, yeah. One of them. One of them. Right. So, but it is um, the 404. Peter, let me go back to, to, to the Civil War for a minute. Sure. Uh, one of the interesting things that the Civil War did was to standardize railroad gauge. Prior to the Civil War, every railroad chose how wide to make its own tracks. Okay. In England, the tradition was four feet, eight and one half inches. And a lot of railroads here, particularly ones that initially imported British engines, used that spacing. But there was also what was known as Ohio gauge, and there was also a whole bunch of different gauges down in the south, um, especially very wide gauges, because wide gauges actually gave you a smoother ride. Well, along comes the Civil War, and you're a Union general, and you've got a whole train full of men and supplies, and you get to some southern state where suddenly the rail gauge changes. And what do you do? Because you can't run a, a four feet, eight and a half inch gauge engine over a five foot track. Um, so they tear it up and relay it and keep going. And as a result of the Civil War, that single-handedly caused uh, all of the major railroads in this country to adopt what's now known as standard gauge, which is four feet, eight and a half inches. Now, why four feet, eight and a half inches? There are all kinds of theories. Uh, some say it was the width 
of the wheels of a Roman chariot. <laughs> and if you go to England on some of those stone roads, you'll see the grooves in the roads of the chariot. Others say it's the common average width of wagon wheels. And since many of the early railroad cars were basically just wagon wheels with flanges on them, they just continued the same spacing. But to this day, you go out, it's four feet, eight and a half inches between the inside faces of the rails. Mm -hmm. A little bit of trivia. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Gene. Yes. When did they construct the station house for Highland? You mean the old church? What we call, yeah. the, call the station house or the depot? The, the depot. The depot was built uh, in 1871 as the line came through. And uh, we'll talk about that next okay. month. But the, the Pier Marquette had a kind of standard plan uh, for a lot of these rural depots. And uh, ours was, ours and Milford were very much cousins. Um, the one up in Clyde was a little bit different and then it burned, and when, by the time it burned and they had to rebuild it, they had a more updated design, so it looks different. But um, there was a pretty standard uh, design of these things. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much for your patience. I hope it was interesting. I'm, I apologize for the fact that this kind of history does not lend itself to visuals. There are not a lot of photographs from the 1840s and 50s and even the 1860s. So I had to make do with a lot of newspaper and, uh, and maps and so forth, but- You did a marvelous job with that. Thank you very much. It was well, great, Gene. Very well done. Great. Thank you. Well, next time we're gonna have a lot of fun uh, with all the things that the railroad meant to this town uh, from, say, 1871 up into the early 1900s. And some of them are quite, quite fascinating. So I think, I think you'll find that second session enjoyable, too. Anyone else? Well, Gene, I just want to compliment you. I, I appreciate uh, the, the why, the motivation on, on some of this historical stuff, and obviously some of the speculation. But, you know, you can, you can trust human nature is human nature, and, and uh, the events... Um, it's what we normally see, but uh, that's not necessarily always the motivation that causes it. So I appreciate your addressing some of that. Well, that's the thing I, I find fascinating about a history. Uh, you can have a, a laundry list of dates, names, and places, and that's, that's dry as toast. Um, it truly is how all of these pieces fit together, and as you say, how, how human nature fits together. Um, it's interesting, for example, if I were to go back to the bill that Squire Rowe initially uh, introduced, you'll notice that it mentioned Washtenaw County. Now, Washtenaw County is nowhere near Wayne or Monroe. Uh, why did he put that in that original bill? He wanted to keep his options open. He had people up in Highland that were, as we saw, talking about maybe running the road down to Ann Arbor rather than the other way. So by keeping that in the bill, uh, he wasn't locking himself in. Um, and, and that story behind the story is really what makes, makes this fun. And okay. you'll, get, you'll get some of that next month as well. Terrific. Anyone else? Heidi was wondering um, about the year and circumstances of the trains colliding at uh, Clyde Road Depot. Oh, that? Yeah, we'll talk about that next time. Uh, the one that there's like four or five photographs of. Um, yeah, a very tragic accident up at Clyde uh, resulted in the death of, of the firemen on one of the, one of the trains. And um, we'll talk about that both from a railroading point of view is one of the negative impacts but as you'll also learn it was kind of cheap entertainment to put, put the it the picture is amazing yeah that you have on the historical site 
people people would go see train wrecks. They would travel miles to go see a train wreck. Uh, it was just fascinating that this huge piece of iron and steel and then spitting smoke like some wounded dragon and uh, you know I'm sure they weren't happy that that folks got hurt or died but it was just it was just something to gawk at I suppose same way that we'll slow down going by a wreck on the freeway um, there's one accident I'll tell you about next month that happened up between Clyde and Rose and According to the Milford Times, 50 people from Milford drove all the way up there, rode all the way up there just to, to see it. Gene, I think Thank it's you. Been, excuse me, Gene, I think it's interesting you uh, bringing up the discussions about Monroe and uh, how the town and how the towns all along the route were looking for ways to bring commerce into their communities. You know, over the last 30, 50 years, there's been a lot of competition, obviously, between Oakland County, Macomb County, and, and Wayne County. And we hear a lot about it, not so much today as we have uh, a few years ago. But to think about this, uh, the growth of the state during the time period that you were presenting how difficult it must have been in the legislature to get uh, common uh, uh, support for uh, the towns and public funding being paid for the development of, of um, docks and, uh, and shipping um, uh, you know, centers. Uh, well, it, it's... It's fascinating how the railroads really kind of led during this period that you were discussing from the 1830s to the, what, 1890s maybe? Yeah. 1900s. Well, there, there are a couple of things. As far as the legislatures go, um, things were a lot different back then. And I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine was kind of the order of the day they would pass these public assistance bills right and left um, on the theory that even if it wasn't good for my town, your railroad would still be good for the state as a whole and vice versa. So there was a, a, a lot of cooperation in that regard. Another thing in terms of, of these public assistance bills, I was not going to go into that in main talk, but the irony is, is that in 1870, um, there was a case in the Michigan Supreme Court called Salem versus uh, People. And Salem was on the proposed line for that Detroit to Holly route that I pointed out to you. And the town had voted to give that Detroit and Howell Railroad uh, public money. But when the time came to um, sort of cash in, the um, town treasurer said, no, that's unconstitutional. And it went all the way up to the Michigan Supreme Court. And the Michigan Supreme Court threw out every single one of those public assistance bills, like Mr. Rose. So at the end of the day, it didn't do much good. Now, it was not retroactive if the money had already been collected, they didn't have to pay it back. But basically Michigan, Michigan had gotten burned in the 1830s by these state run transportation projects. And so the Michigan constitution of 1850 actually outlawed giving money for roads and canals and so forth. And the legislature thought it had found a way around it by saying, well, okay, we won't build these public works directly, but we'll give money to private companies to do it. And so that whole scheme went out the, the window. Um, the federal government also had a tremendous impact. Uh, the Pierre Marquette profited very handsomely by a law that was passed in 1855 by Congress that gave them 
I've forgotten how many sections of land along every 20, oh, it was alternate sections of land, one on the east, one on the west, or one on the north, one on the south, uh, as they went along the track. And they could then borrow against that land or hold it and sell it for a profit and so forth. I mean, the federal government was handing out land right and left. Um, that's how the, the three big transcontinental lines went through. So there was a lot of that going on. And, and the federal government's position was, wait a minute, we need to build a nationwide infrastructure, uh, particularly if we are going out west. Uh, there's no major rivers. There's no, you know, nothing west of the Missouri, basically, or the Red River. So how do you, how do you get a troop of soldiers out into Indian country? Well, you got to get there by railroad. Well, then it only took another 80 years to build the interstate system. Yes. <laughs> or, as it is technically called, the National Defense Highway System. Right, right. Eisenhower's uh, dream. Yeah. Eisenhower, when he was a young private, or corporal, I can't remember which, 1918, was part of a truck convoy that tried to go across country. Um over the Lincoln Highway. And that experience was so traumatic that after he went to Europe during the war and saw the German autobahns, he said, look, we need something like that. <laughs> and that's where that came from. We need the ability to move tanks and jeeps and trucks and soldiers from one side of the country to the other without having to stop at every podunk town along the way. Well, thank you all very much. I, I appreciate the interest and hopefully I, I didn't disappoint. And no. um, if there's something you, you missed or was unclear, I'm told this was recorded and hopefully it'll be posted on uh, Township's YouTube site. So thank you. <laughs>